Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this third Sunday after the Epiphany. Today we're going to be taking a look at uh, the second lesson for today, actually just a portion of that second letter, um, the first few verses. And the general concept today in our readings is light, um, how Christ is the light of the world, the light that shone into the darkness. And as we go through that concept of light and darkness this morning in our message, we're going to see as we move toward the end of that message and we consider then what John says in respect to that light in our life, how do we know we're in Christ? Well, as the words on this screen uh, speak to us from that text, we know that we abide in him if we live the life that he himself lived when he was here on earth. So with that in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us this opportunity today to gather around the gospel, the wonderful gospel message that is the light to show us the way to salvation. It is that light that reveals your Son to us. Let that light shine brightly in our hearts today and even glow brighter as we study the wonderful message of the gospel that we might be lights in the world. Bless us today with your presence as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. We begin our worship this morning with our opening hymn, hymn 375, Arise and Shine in Splendor. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature 
and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated. Our scripture readings for today are the readings for the third Sunday after Epiphany. And for our first lesson, we turn to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 8. We begin our reading at verse 19. When they tell you, consult the mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, shouldn't a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If people do not speak according to this word, there will be no more dawn for them. They will pass through the land distressed and starving. But when this takes place and they are starving, they will be frustrated. And they will curse their king and their God. They will turn their faces upward and they will look down to the ground. But I tell you, they will see only distress, darkness, and the gloom that brings anguish. They will be banished into thick darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for the land that was in anguish. In former times, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will cause it to be glorious along the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles." The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you like the joy at harvest time, like the celebration when people divide the plunder. For you have shattered the yoke that burdened them. You have broken the bar on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor as you did in the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. We now turn our attention to the words, a portion of which the first few verses will serve as our sermon text. They're taken from John's first epistle, the second chapter. Our reading begins with verse 3. This is how we know that we have known him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. If anyone keeps God's word, the love of God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk as Jesus walked. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one that you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message you heard. At the same time, the command I am writing is new. It is true in Jesus and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is still in the darkness. The one who loves his brother remains in the light and nothing causes him to stumble. The one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness 
has blinded his eyes. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Please rise for our reading from the Gospels. Today's Gospel reading comes from the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We begin reading at verse 12. When Jesus heard that John was put in prison, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. He did this to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, along the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. He said to them, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother's brother, John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. Jesus called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Please be seated. Our next hymn for this morning is hymn 518, Christ Be My Leader.
So we turn our attention back to the words which served as our second lesson for today. And our focus is on verses 3 through 6 of that reading. I'll read those verses once again. This is how we know that we have known him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I know him, but does not keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If anyone keeps his word, the love of God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk as Jesus walked. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we have this opportunity to study these words recorded by John by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your power and strength to grant, gain greater understanding of what it means to walk with your Son Help us to treasure the light that he has shed uh, on us through the gospel message. And may that light bright, shine brightly in our lives always. Bless our study as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. I want you to listen to the words that John wrote in the opening verses of his gospel. He said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You'll notice that the term word is capitalized. It's because it is a reference to Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, everything was made. And without him, not one thing was made that has been made. In him was life. And the life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What does Jesus coming into this world mark? It marks that light was now shining in this world of darkness. The Lord through the prophet Isaiah wrote, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. In our gospel reading for today, Matthew shows us that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of these prophecies of light found in the Old Testament. He is the great light, the light that God sent into this world. For you see, the world was sitting in the realm of the darkness of sin. I think the best way to help us try to understand exactly what we mean by this darkness is to consider what it is like if you go into a cave. One author wrote this about his experience in Mammoth Cave National Park as a child. He said, the park ranger then said, people always ask me what it is like to get lost in this cave system without light. Well, let me show you. He then shut out the light. The result was pitch blackness that I had never experienced in my life. No matter how hard I strained my eyes, I could not see my hand in front of my face. I had to let go of my mother's hand and went to grab it again, only to have someone say abruptly, Who is that? It was not my mother. I did not dare move an inch. Some of you might have had this very same experience. I've, I've not had it myself, but I've heard a number of people talk about it and how eerie it is and how utterly dark it is. No matter how hard you strain, you cannot see anything. That is what sin entering into the world was all about. As a result of sin entering into the world, the spiritual vision of humanity was gone. Humans could no longer see the truth. And the end result was, is that as they made the wrong choices in life, they were unable to see the end result of it. And that end result being what? Punishment. Standing out in utter darkness for all eternity in hell. But now, now there was hope. There was light. You know, when you think about the, uh, the creation of the world, light did not exist until when? God called it into existence. And the same thing is true when it comes to spiritual light for humanity. Light was lost the moment Adam and Eve fell into sin. And so in order for humans to be able to be restored back to a position where they had spiritual light, God was going to have to provide it. And He provided it through His one and only Son. 
What is really amazing in our gospel message for today is where God would first reveal this light in the opening portion of Jesus' ministry. Where is it revealed? Capernaum. Beale and Carson in a commentary on this section says, As with four of the five prophecies in the infancy narratives, Matthew again wants to link a specific geo geographical location with Old Testament prophecy. Capernaum, near the Jordan River, by the Sea of Galilee, in a province populated with even more Gentiles in the first century than in Isaiah's day. Where is it revealed? Not in Jerusalem, but in a region that is riddled with nothing but Gentiles. Jesus begins to preach and teach the gospel message, not in Judea where Jerusalem is located, but instead in this land of Galilee. It was a great dawning of the Messiah to break over the world here as Jesus begins to preach and teach the message of repentance. It is in this place of utter darkness, at least so considered by the Jews, because these are nothing but Gentiles, what happens? Light begins to shine. And what would this light do? Jesus' public ministry spanned approximately three years. And during these three years, he's in the public eye doing what? Unveiling the light that had been hidden, put under a bushel basket by the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day. Here's what the prophet Isaiah wrote about such men as Jesus experienced in his ministry, those spiritual leaders, those know-it-alls. He said, therefore, listen to this, declares the Lord. I am against the prophets who steal my words from each other. Indeed, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their own tongues to say, this is what the Lord declares. Yes, I am against those who prophesy about lying dreams, declares the Lord. I'm against those who tell lying dreams to lead my people astray with their extravagant lies. But I did not send them or command them. They provide no benefit for this people, declares the Lord. What had the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day done with the light of the gospel found in the Old Testament? What they had done was taken the spiritual message of the Old Testament and turned it into a nationalistic message for the Jews. What they did was they took the imagery of the Messiah in the Old Testament and they politicized him and turned him into this war hero who was going to come into this world, amass an army, and overthrow whatever foreign oppression was ruling the Jews at that particular time. They taught that this Messiah was then going to reestablish Jerusalem as the headquarters for the entire world, that Israel would now become the nation of all nations once again as that it had been under King David. And that all of their needs would miraculously be taken care of and basically they would be living in heaven here on earth. They taught that they deserved this, that they had been wronged by the other nations of the world. And as a result, the nations of the world needed to fall on their knees and repent for all of the things that they had done against them. Sin, repentance, Redeemer. These were certainly things that needed to be preached, but not in the way that these spiritual leaders said that they should be preached. It was a message that was to be preached to all people. The problem as today was not political or worldly. It was spiritual. Paul spoke of the problem this way in his letter to the Romans. He said, So then just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sinned. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, the consequences of their Decision spread to all people. And what was the consequence? All humanity was destroyed spiritually. And so the end result is, is that every person born into this world is spiritually blind. They are living in the utter darkness of sin. They are spiritually dead. And yet, what does Paul go on to say just a few verses after verse 12? In 18 and, ni through ni and 19, he says, So then just as one trespass led to the verdict of condemnation for all people. So, and what we've got here is we've got the comparison of the two Adams. 
the Adam at the beginning and the second Adam being Christ. So, because of what Adam did by choice, condemnation, God's wrath was on all people. So also, one righteous verdict led to life-giving justification for all people. That's the result of Jesus' work. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many became sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will become righteous. Recall what the Lord God said to Adam, or excuse me, to uh, Satan, immediately after the fall into sin. He turns his attention, before he talks to Adam and Eve, he turns his attention to Satan and he says, all right, you've brought down the human race, you've brought sin into this world, you've separated them from me, but I'm going to just let you understand this, this isn't over. Someday, through a descendant of Eve, is going to come a Savior, and when he comes, he's going to crush your head. That someone, of course, is this light who is the focus of our study here today, Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, see, he wasn't born into this world in darkness. He's the light that's shining in the darkness. Why is he light? Yes, he's Mary's son, but he's also God's son from eternity, perfect in every way. And this is displayed in the way he walked, the way he lived. You can take Jesus' life and put it under the strongest microscope you can find, and you will not find one slip-up, one mistake, one sin that condemns you. So that on three occasions in the course of those three years of public ministry, the father would testify, hey, here's my boy. I love him, and he's perfect. There's nothing about him that I'm dissatisfied with. And in his perfect obedience, he laid down his life at Calvary with the trespasses that you and I have committed. He took upon himself our sin, and there, as he is sacrificed, blood is spilt. Blood that was foreshadowed in all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Blood was going to be the answer, but not the blood of bulls, not the blood of goats, but the blood of the sinless Lamb of God that would be shed at Calvary. And you know what the end result is? You and I can place our confidence and find our comfort in the words that Jesus spoke to the paralytic when he said, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. We are confident that our sins are fully removed and now we stand in the presence of God, holy and perfect. But you know, even though God sent His one and only Son into this world to shine light, what do we still find? We still see very much the darkness of sin. And yet, even though that darkness is found in the places where there is nothing but utter unbelief, we also see that there are places of light. Where are the places of light? The places of light are found where God's people, you and I, are found. We are the lights. Jesus said in John's Gospel, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Even though we live in a sin-darkened world, you and I do not walk in that darkness. We walk in light because we are in Him. He's the source of that light. He is the light. Jesus said also in the 12th chapter, He says, I have come into the world as a light so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. We do not live in the darkness. What is in our hearts? What's burning brightly in our hearts? The light of the gospel message. And now this gospel message shines forth in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we speak, in the way that we act. In a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this. He said, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What does being a disciple of Jesus involve? It involves walking in the light. Showing love for our gracious God who has rescued us from our sin and showing love to those around us. Our Savior is the light of the world and now we reflect that light to those around us. This is how we know that we are Christians. 
That's what John is saying in the words of our text. He says, this is how we know that we have known him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If anyone keeps God's word, the love of God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk as Jesus walked. Literally, the first part of that section, the Greek is saying this. By this we know that we have known him. Listen again. By this we know that we have known him. Now, what does the word, the term, know mean? That term that is used, and by the way, the Greek has several different terms for know. In this particular case, the word that it uses not only means that you perceive something, but it also means that you have an understanding of it. How do we know that we are disciples of Christ? We know that we are, we know that we know we are in Him because we not only have a perception of it, we understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, look at your life. The one who is a disciple of Jesus is going to put Jesus' words into action. Or, as the words very clearly say, we are going to walk as He walked while He was here on the face of this earth. For when we come to faith in Christ, what do the scriptures tell us happen? We are now in Christ. We're not in the world. We are in Christ. The picture of that is seen in John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him is the one who bears much fruit, because uh, without me you can do nothing. The moment we came to faith, we were attached to Jesus, the main vine. We were branches that were grafted in. Okay? Now, when you think about a great plant. You've got the main vine and you've got the branches that come off. And in order for that branch to produce grapes this later this year, what's got to happen? It's got to stay attached to that vine. It's got to keep getting its sustenance, nutrients from the main vine. It's getting the nutrients from the soil so that eventually grapes are going to be formed. And the same thing is true for us as God's people. In order for us to bear fruit, we've got to be attached to Jesus. And if we are attached to Jesus, then what's happening? His power and strength is coursing through us so that it's not, well, you might produce good works. You will produce good works. You will produce fruit in keeping with God's will. And so we say then, along with the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the Galatian Christians, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but what? Christ lives in me. The life I am now living in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is how we know that Christ lives in us. This is how we know that we have been raised from death to spiritual life. This is how we know that the light of truth is now shining in our lives. For the one who does not live as Christ did is not in him is not a Christian. And James was very clear about that. He said, So also such faith, if it is alone and has no works, it is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Our faith is evident in the things that we do. You know, over the course of the centuries, people have taken the grace of God and cheapened it. You know how they did that? They say, doesn't matter what I do, I'm forgiven. I can sin as much as I want, it doesn't matter. I can always go back to God and God is going to forgive me. Cheap grace. Paul answers that problem in his letter to the Romans. In the sixth chapter, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, shall I go out and do as many things against the law as I possibly can so I can even have a greater abundance of God's grace? His answer, absolutely not. An extremely strong negative is used here in the Greek. He said, we died to sin. How can we go on living it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Look at the significance of our baptism. Not some symbolic rite. Something's happening here. In the waters of baptism, God the Holy Spirit through the promises attached to that Gracious water is doing what? We're dying with Christ. And what does that mean we're dying with Him? It means this way of darkness, we hate it, we despise it, we don't love it anymore. 
when we did, we, before we knew him, we loved it. We don't love it anymore. We just, we want to be out of that darkness. And as Christ was raised from the dead, glorious, we've now been raised to a new way of life. A life that hates that life, a life that imitates that of Christ. Is there something troubling you at this point? There's something that's troubling me very much so. You know what it is? If this is the case, that I am in Christ, and His light is shining in me, and I'm this new creation, why did I have to speak those words that we all spoke together at the beginning of our service? Why do I have to do that every week? Why do I have to do that every day? You see, every time I take a look in the mirror of God's law, I see something I despise very much. I still find myself falling into sin. My life still displays darkness. Paul talked about this struggle in the seventh chapter of Romans. He said, for I do not understand what I am doing because I do not keep doing what I want. Instead, I do what I hate. I don't want to do those things. My new heart, my new person despises it. It hates it. And yet, what do I find? Myself slipping back into sin and I hate myself for it. Does this now mean I'm not a Christian? No, it actually means just the opposite. But these sins would not trouble me if the light of Christ was not shining in my life. I know that whatever good I do accomplish in the course of my life by the power of Christ living in me has nothing to do with my entrance into heaven. That bill has been paid for with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And so I say along with Paul at the end of that section, what a miserable wretch I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am a wretched sinner that is only saved through the blood of Christ. And so it is my baptism teaches me that every day of my life I've got to go through that process of dying and rising again. The process of contrition and repentance. And as I rise in His presence, in that process of repentance, as I recognize my sin and I look only to Him for my salvation, I hear Him telling me now, go, go and sin no more. His love for me is overwhelming. And it leads me now to be more determined to carry out His will as a light to the world, to the glory of His name. Jesus was foretold to be that light of the world. The world that was sitting in the darkness. The light of truth came into this world for Jew and Gentile alike. Jesus has returned to that kingdom of light in heaven to await the day when He will come again in all of His glory to do what? To destroy this world of darkness completely and from the ashes create this new heaven and new earth that won't need a sun, a physical sun, because He will be the light of that kingdom. A kingdom in which you and I will be perfect lights for all eternity. Let us help one another and encourage one another as we must still right now continue to live in this world that is marked by darkness. To not follow the darkness, to not be drawn to the darkness, to not imitate the darkness, but instead be like Jesus, the light of the world, so that we can bring others into this light and they too might find the freedom and the joy and the peace that only comes from following Him who indeed was the true light. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me now in making confession of your Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life for the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, we know how dismal and depressing it can be, especially in the area that we live in as we experience so much darkness in a sense, lack of sunshine. And that is true in a spiritual sense, that as much as we people are led by the darkness of sin, think that they are going to find a path of happiness and joy. It is not a path of joy, but only a path of destruction. As you created physical light to give us joy, to give us health, how much more thankful we are for the spiritual light you have granted us in your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who shines the word of truth in our life. That truth which exposes our sin and shows us our inability to save ourselves. And yet that wonderful truth that you and your love sent your son to be that sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. We are so thankful that that light now shines in our hearts. We stand before you today ashamed at times that this light does not always shine as brightly as you would intend. We find ourselves falling into sin and help us by the Spirit to shine that light into our lives to identify those things that are not in keeping with your will. And then as we rise once again hearing that we can be of good cheer, our sins are forgiven, empower us, strengthen us to be lights to the world, that people might see your Son in us and through us we have the ability and the opportunity to share the gospel with others so that the light of the gospel might shine in their lights. As we live out our lives on the face of this earth, help us to keep our eyes focused on that source of light. Help us to keep our eyes focused on our real home. May we not live our lives in a way in which we only see the world around us, but instead let that future life with you affect everything that we do. And may that be evident to the world around us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, especially on behalf of Ron Kegley, who has the joy of celebrating his 90th birthday. We thank you for these many years that you have given to him, these years of health. And we thank you for his family that has the opportunity to share this wondrous opportunity with him. We pray that you would continue to grant him good health and help him to continue to be a light to his family and to this congregation. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. During the distribution of the Lord's Supper, the congregation will sing hymn 667.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we pray, O oh God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness, you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We close this morning's service with hymn 704. We sing stanza one. <laughs>